Hey guys, welcome to the channel. We are uh, starting out this new series. Hopefully it uh, is helpful out. Helpful out? That's a nice one. <laughs> um, so today we're going to set up a Unify network from scratch. Uh, we've got six switches, switch aggregation, Unify Dream Machine Pro, uh, 30 access points, and yeah, it's a pretty large deployment for a nursing home and it's going in here in a couple days. So I'm just going to walk through the basics on uh, what I do to set up a Unify network. All right, so we've got all the gear uh, set up and powered on here, uh, minus the access points. I'm going to get to that here in just a little while. Uh, the first thing you want to do with your dream machine is plug in the cable. Uh, so I've got a WAN cable here from my uh, home network. So we'll plug that in, let it negotiate. And once we get it up and set up, we are going to work on the connecting the switches, adopting them, and getting them provisioned. So the fastest way to get the Dream Machine online uh, quickly is to download the app. So what we'll do is we'll set up the um, app to provision the Dream Machine, update it, and then I'm going to log into it with Chrome because I like that interface much better than the small phone screen. Okay, so on the phone, um, in the Unify app, if you go back and click on the Unify app, uh, it will detect with Bluetooth the UDM Pro. We're going to click Setup. We're going to name this one uh, Delta South. It's just going to be in a business. Uh, healthcare, 1 to 100, that's probably about right. We're going to use my Ubiquity account so it shows up with everything else. Uh, auto optimize. I'm actually going to turn this off. Uh, it can have some weird effects on the network. Uh, I personally like to keep control over what the access points are doing, what channels they're on. Um, and the auto optimize, um, if it detects radar from an airplane uh, or something like that, it can maybe force the system to change channels, and we don't want that. Uh, send diagnostics and performance. Uh, I can do that. We like Ubiquity guys. Uh, update schedule. I'm going to turn this off because also I want to be in control of when the updates happen, not to disrupt any business. Uh, currently, we are plugged into a gig fiber. And they will have a gig over there as well. Uh, one interesting thing that I learned about the Dream Machine Pro is if you set your uh, bandwidth lower than the service speed, it automatically throttles everything. So if you've got a 100 meg connection and uh, you set your upload download bandwidth inside the Unify controller to, um, you know, say 50, that's your max. Um, I don't understand why it throttles down, uh, but that was a lesson learned the hard way. <laughs> um, so currently the download speed that I'm being fed here, and this is running through my dream machine at the house, two more switches, uh, so there's a little bit um, of a thing there. So I'm getting 667 megs download, 853 up. That latency also seems a little high because this uh, SEMO fiber is super fast. So what I'm going to do, since we're going to have a gig, I'm going to put 1,000 megs here and 1,000 megs there so the Dream Machine doesn't accidentally try to uh, throttle something for us. So we're going to review the configuration uh, yes, it's going to my newfangled account. It's going to Delta South. That's what we're going to name it. Time zone's correct. Yes. Finished. So it's setting up a basic uh, network for us to use. It may also check for firmware updates. Okay, setup complete in 3 minutes and 14 seconds. Not too bad. So we'll go ahead and go to the dashboard here. 
I'm gonna make sure that this uh ta -ta. yeah there it is. Five stars ubiquity, thank you. Okay. So now we're gonna go through and start hooking up the switches and we'll tie my computer itself onto that network so we can access it locally and make all our setup and configuration changes from there. Because doing it on the app works great if you've got two access points and a switch, uh, but this is gonna be a much longer setup process, so I'd like to have it on the screen. All right, so first thing I wanna do is try out this new switch aggregation. Uh, just pull these little caps out. Uh, they're protecting the SFP slots. Um, I haven't actually used this switch aggregation device yet, so this is uncharted territory for me as well. They're going to use the unified direct attach SFP cable. So keep a 10 gig link in between the Dream Machine and uh, the switch aggregation. And then I'll also use a 10 gig link between the switch aggregator and the uh, 48 port USW Pro. Uh, the other switches, the 16 ports over here, will all be one gig links. We are gonna use fiber. Uh, as you can see the fiber modules here, uh, but I believe the 16 port switch is only good for uh, one gig on the SFP ports. And that's all we really need. Each switch is gonna have six access points on it, maybe seven. Uh, not a lot of high usage on those, and they're distributed throughout the building. Uh, so you take the little blue uh, protectors off, slide it in, doesn't fit, flip it over. There you go, it should click. And we did it again. There we go. And we have link lights, so that's uh, fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the 48 port switch to this mix as well. Actually, let's put him in port one. Okay, we're gonna log into the uh, computer, see what we uh, can find here. Okay, so once you're on your computer, um, navigate to system preferences if you're on a Mac, um, and then we'll go to network. We're gonna look at ethernet. We're gonna see what our IP address is and what the router's IP address is. And this is how we're gonna log into uh, the Dream Machine Pro. So we'll copy that. Then we'll click over to Chrome and put this up here. Paste and go. Connection's not private. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So it should be tied to my Unify account. So we're going to try to log in with that. Sometimes this is weird the first time, uh, but we're going to give it a shot. Could be a typo, let's try it again. There we go. Okay, so this is the main interface for the Dream Machine Pro. If you have other, uh, the other apps running, like if you had cameras and you wanted to do protect, uh, that would show up here as well. I believe they have the access and the talk controllers as well. You can control all those settings in here and tell it which applications to run. Uh, the Protect controller will not run unless you install a hard drive. Uh, for this project, I'm not using uh, Protect, so I don't need the hard drive and I don't need the app to run. But uh, this is where you can tell which apps uh, to run. If we go back to General, everything looks fine so far. Uh, we can give it a location. 
Uh, this is going to be in Sagston, Missouri. I'll put the exact address in later. We'll confirm that. Uh, advanced settings. You always want to turn on SSH. First thing, because sometimes Ubiquity gets the uh, software wrong. <laughs> And you can easily lock yourself out of these sometimes. I do it on the Dream Machine, and I also do it on the Unify controller as well, and the Protect controller if I'm running that as well. So we're going to give it a password. Oh, hang on. Write this down every time. <laughs> Automatic firmware updates are disabled. Now this is where you can go to factory reset or restart the device as well. Uh, so to get back to the main uh, screen, you can just hit uh, the U in the corner. That'll take you back to the main interface. We're gonna go into network. This is the main dashboard for the Unify controller. Uh, this is running the old software, so I bet there is a firmware update available. Let's actually go back. Uh, for a cloud key and any other Unify controllers, the firmware for the controller you update directly in in the network app. But in the Dream Machine, everything comes through the firmware on the Dream Machine. So yeah, 1.6.8. Yeah, we're we're way behind on this one. Update available. Hey, that's interesting. A little anagram. I'm going to go up to version 1.8.6. And then I'll get back to you here as soon as that update is finished. So the device reboots as part of the upgrade process. So we'll wait for it to boot up and we'll log back into it. Okay, so it looks like it is booting back up. It's picked up the 48 port switch. We're not going to add it just yet. We'll wait for this to get fully uh, booted back up. Oh, and it went ahead and turned on these two apps for us with the update. So we're going to go ahead and turn those back off because we are not using either of those. No sense in wasting the resources. And the Protect controller should not even try to open because it doesn't have a hard drive installed. Oh, it did. Interesting. Go ahead and stop protect as well. Okay, and then back to our main screen. Unify network. And over here in the devices tab, we're going to click that. And we're going to see what we have here so far. We have the switch aggregation unit and the USW Pro 48 which are both ready to adopt. And what we'll do is we're going to adopt them first. We'll go ahead and adopt them both. And then I'll run the upgrade for those. And I'm going to start adding the rest of the switches. Usually takes a minute or two to provision. What it does is it ties the switches to this Unify, Unify controller. So if someone else plugged in for whatever reason, another uh, Unify Security Gateway or UDM Pro or anything else, uh, it's tied to this controller and can't be taken over by another one. The access points do the same thing. Oh, perfect. So we will go ahead and upgrade the firmware on these. We're going from not a massive upgrade on the switch aggregation. It's a newer unit. Let's see how far off this one is. Oh yeah, version 4.0.64 to 5.43. Definitely do that. All right, and this will take a few more minutes, so I'm going to plug up the other switches and we'll get them going as well. So these switches are still updating. Handy having these nice screens. I like the screens. Also glad that they put a little screensaver on them uh, because previously they were just black screens, but now with the new software update, it actually does a nice little like star field animation. 
and just let you know that it's on and working if you couldn't see all the blinking lights, I guess. But uh, it's still nice having something on the screen even when they're sleeping. So I have these uh, SFP to Ethernet adapters that I'm going to use for this just so I can make sure that the switch aggregation device works as intended. I'm sure it does, but since it's my first time using it, uh, we're going to see. Run it through its paces, I guess is what you'd say. But I don't have any more of the direct attached copper cables, so this is uh, where we're going to go with that. And then I will need one for the switch aggregation as well. I'll just use a standard little patch cable here to connect the two. I'll probably do the rest of the switches just with Ethernet uh, to simplify this process, but again, I just want to make sure that the switch aggregation device is doing what it needs to do. Switches. I'm going to actually route them through the 48 port switch. Uh, for now, it shouldn't matter. Topology. Once we get once we get them adopted and upgraded, uh, they'll be all set, ready to go. So now. We have the switch 48 is booted back up. There's the nice star field animation. Uh, they'll all sync up here once we stop messing with them. And the aggregation unit is still updating. So that's interesting. Uh, the screens on these are still black because we've not updated them yet. Uh, I've got the top switch here is plugged in with our SFP to ethernet adapters uh, running through the switch aggregation unit. And then the others are just running through the 48 port switch uh, just to get them adopted and upgraded for now. So it looks like the switch aggregation unit has updated properly, uh, but the screen is till, still telling me that it's in update status. So I'm gonna go ahead and send it a reboot and we will see it comes back a little happier okay so I found the restart button I knew it was here somewhere it's uh, back in the main screen with all your devices highlight over here on the far right restart yes please restart one more time uh, on this reboot the screen did not come back on so I'm not sure what's going on with that this is bad firmware whatever um, so I did realize that I forgot to turn on SSH uh, because I'm sitting here thinking about how to re-provision or force firmware upgrade that device and I haven't set up the SSH yet. So I believe that is down here in controller. Okay, so to set up your SSH in the Unify controller, go to settings and then go to site. And this is the older settings view. You have the new settings view. I'm not that fond of it just yet. It's hard to find things. Um, some Most things are in this new interface. The other interface is still kind of getting, you know, it's labeled beta uh, for a reason. So SSH, we're going to enable. It's down here at the bottom if you scroll all the way down. Device authentication. Uh, I'm going to set this as root and then my password. I make it the same for both the or for all the controllers. That way, it's easier to keep track of and yada yada. And then just hit apply changes. Now SSH is enabled. If we wanted to log into that, uh, we could go to terminal on the Mac and SSH into the device and command line control. 
that's a little outside the scope of this video, so we're just gonna make sure that we can if we need to, and hopefully we don't. All right, so the switch aggregation unit is back up. Screen is still not working though. So I don't know what that is all about. But we can mess with that at a later time. Okay, so we need to adopt our 16 port switches. So I'm gonna go ahead and adopt all those. And while that's happening, I'm gonna hook up the eight port switch as well and get it on the network. Pending adoption, all right, we're gonna go ahead and adopt it. Too slow, notification, we already did it. The new pop-up is very nice though. Uh, when we're doing cameras, doing the Unify Protect cameras, it's really, uh, really handy to pop the app open and just slam in a camera and it automatically updates the cameras to where it goes. Uh, these do not, they just adopt, so we will have to go through and manually update um, the 16 port and the 8 port switch as well. I'm going to say don't ask again because we're going to do this a few times. USW8, yes. Upgrade that one. Upgrade that one. Get out of the way. That one needs to be upgraded as well, and I think we have all of them, yes. Okay. Next thing I do is go through and label these, uh, both digitally and physically. That way, whenever we install them, we know which room they're going to. We know, um, keeps everything a lot nicer. I do the same with the access points as well, which we'll get to here in just a little while. So on the switches with the new screens, it's nice because it gives you the, you know, the status update of what's happening. So these are in the restart process of the upgrade. Uh, the older switches, if you get a 16 port that doesn't have the screen or any of these smaller switches, the light will actually blink blue and white while it is updating. Once it turns solid blue, usually means it's done with its process. Uh, this little switch is cool. I have a few of these around my house, uh, you know, in the theater room and the in my office. Um, I've got four ports of PoE, only a 60 watt budget, I believe, uh, which is plenty for, you know, small projects for where this is going and what I'm doing here in, in the house. That works great. Um, 16 ports are coming online, doing their nice little chase with the LEDs. But the thing runs hot. Uh, one thing I always like to do with my network deployments, uh, I do this on basically all of my networks. When you set up your DHCP server, uh, this is all set up as default. Uh, this screen, the uh, settings, networks, is where you'll go to change your static IP for your WAN interface, which we'll do once we get to the site and on that service. Uh, but you can also create separate VLANs and uh, adjust your DHCP settings here. So I'm going to edit this uh, LAN network, and this is going to be our main uh, network, main VLAN. We're going to leave the scope the same. I believe that'll work. Uh, I'm going to change this to my domain. And on the DHCP server, I'm going to give us a little bit more range here. So I've got 30 access point access points, six switches, seven switches with the switch aggregation. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to make the DHCP pool start at 50, actually 51. So that gives us 50 free addresses that we can assign statically to all of our equipment and printers and anything else that you know may come up throughout the building that we want to um, have static IPs for. So we'll go ahead and save that. I believe some of our devices were down in 
that range already. Yes, dot 34, dot 7, dot 24. So what we'll do is we're going to reboot those switches so they get a new IP address when they come back. And then I'm going to go through and set them all to be a static IP. So we control where they're at. They don't bounce around on the network. Every time they boot up, if there's a power failure, they go back to the same place. They don't step on a computer or someone's iPhone or something anywhere else in the building. And they're just always in the same place. Static IPs are very good, especially in VoIP applications and uh, basically anything that doesn't need to get a new address every time it gets on the network. You can see the IP address is updating now as they are restarting. So now they're up in the DHCP scope. I can go through and start naming the devices so the 8 port switch is going to go into a secondary building, which is behind the main building. It's going to be the USW8 laundry. Each of the four 16 port switches are going in the hallway, so let's say this will be the Northwest Hall 16 port. East Hall, USW Pro 48 is just going to be our main switch, so I really don't need to name it. We know where it's at. The switch aggregation is also going to be in the main rack with the UDM Pro as well. So we'll just leave those as is. You could name them if you want. But... And then what I'll do is I will take the MAC address from each device. So the Northeast Hall. Take a P-Touch label or whatever label maker that you like. And uh, physically label everything. So here we have the standard Brother P-Touch label maker. Uh, nothing special. I uh, use it all the time. My friend uh, doesn't like P-Touch. He just says woof. <laughs> but they seem to work out well for me so until there's another affordable solution that does basic labels I guess this is what we're using. So I'll go through and make my labels and uh, put them on the switch. All right, so to find your IP address on, or sorry, the MAC address on your switch, um, just tap the screen if it's in sleep mode, click the little I, scroll over, all kinds of little handy information here. Hardware, what's cool about the new software is all of the devices will follow where you're at in the screen. So Fox 803, that is our Northeast hallway. I'm gonna do the same to the rest of them and not bore you with the details on that, but just wanted to show you how to find the MAC address on each switch. So now we've got everybody labeled. we can go through and start putting our static IP addresses in. So what I like to do is start right there at the UDM. So my main switch, which in this case is gonna be the switch aggregation, we will set it up to be the dot two. Go down here to network, change that to static IP. We are going to make this dot two. My subnet is 255.255.0 slash 24. Uh, the gateway is 192.168.1.1. Uh, we're going to do Cloudflare and Google. These are the DNS servers. Um, if you, it's dynamic name, server. 
domain name server. You know, I don't know. What's that? Whatever. Cut that part out. So we queue the changes there, uh, and we're going to go ahead and be sure to hit apply changes and it will send the changes to the device. Uh, we should probably wait for it to reprovision since most of the other switches are running through it. And now you can see its IP address has been updated to dot two. Very good. We'll go through and do the same. The 48 port switch will be next. So that's gonna be dot three. We'll also go through and set up the DNS servers for the main, uh, the main network LAN as well to be Cloudflare's. Uh, Cloudflare's DNS server is quite a bit faster than Google's. Um, it's noticeable. It's probably about 15, 20 milliseconds faster. So I've been using it as of late, uh, but I always keep the Google um, DNS server as a backup. Uh, both of these are massive. Uh, worldwide DNS servers and they never go down. So, a lot of times, uh, you know, GoSimo Fiber will provide me with a, their DNS servers, which would be the closest. So, it should technically be the fastest, but sometimes ISPs have to route their traffic through another, you know, 10 hops to get to where it's going. So, sometimes it's just better to use one that's the closest. For this particular project, I'm going to set up a couple of different VLANs for uh, this property. Uh, the main VLAN that we already have set up by default uh, will work fine for their corporate network, um, handling the computers and uh, VoIP. Actually, I'm going to make another VoIP uh, VLAN for the phones. I think we're going to see how that goes, but I think I can make that work. Okay, the VLAN 100 is what we're going to name the guest VLAN. Subnet, we'll do 172.16.1.1 slash. Let's make it a 23. And that should give us two full subnets here. Well, it's one subnet, but it should give us a max of uh, 510 clients, which should cover everybody that logs into the guest network. In the building, I don't think they, they've got about 60 rooms, so I think that should be more than enough to cover that, but who knows if someone's got an iPhone or a laptop or both, or, you know, visitors come in with an iPad, all of that. Um, so that should give us plenty of room in the DHCP range to do that. I'm going to go ahead and leave us a little bit of room at the beginning of the subnet again, in case we need to do something on that network uh, with static IPs. I don't foresee us doing that, but... Um, there we go. So that, when you do this, that subtracts from the, ma the max number of clients at 510. So you're, you know, going down to about 460 because we got 50 IP addresses chewed up there. So that still should be more than enough. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And what we'll do with the wireless networks... I don't have the access points in here yet, but we can go ahead and create the wireless network. So we'll say uh, Delta South Guest. We're going to enable that. We're going to put WPA Personal on. And we may change this, but for now, we'll leave it as is. Let's see. And the network we're going to put it on is the Guest VLAN. Advanced options. This gives you a lot of different options to configure the uh, Wi-Fi network. So we can tell the band to either be 2.4 or 5 gigahertz or both. I'm going to leave it on both for now. Uh, you can do multicast or broadcast filtering. Uh, I don't think we need to do it on this just because it's not going to be a super high density network. 
Uh, it's a fast roaming, yes. There's a lot of access points in this building, and they're pretty close together. So I'm going to let fast roaming enable in case someone's on a voice call or they're on Wi-Fi calling on their cell phone. They can walk between access points, and it'll kick them over without dropping the call. Uh, WPA2 only. User group, I'm going to leave that alone. High performance devices. This gets a little weird, but I like it. Because it forces like newer iPhones and newer Android phones to iPads and such to connect only to the five gigahertz radio instead of, um, you know, defaulting to the lazy uh, 2.4 network that's easier for them to connect to. Um, all the other settings I believe we can leave as default, and we'll save that. And now we have wireless network. Once we have the access points in, provisioned, and updated, they'll start broadcasting these networks. I'm going to go ahead and create one for the private network as well. WPA2 personal. This is. And we're going to put this on the main VLAN because we want those clients to be on that network. And there we go. So one thing I just noticed, uh, taking a look through my settings again, I did not, even though when we made the uh, actual VLAN for the guest, it is or it does have its purpose as guest. But when we create the wireless network, we also have to click a checkbox that says enable the guest policies. So I'm not going to do a captive portal for this network because it's going to be behind a password. Uh, and I find captive portals just be annoying. I tried using them uh, for a couple of my car dealerships and it just, it's janky and not useful. So we just let it, let it ride. Um, so we'll check that box, go down and hit save. And then now it is associated here as a guest network. And that keeps all the clients isolated from each other. And the rest of the, the other wireless network and VLAN for the corporate network. Okay, so after the little break there, I uh, realized that the mouse wasn't working in OBS on the Mac. And couldn't figure out how to make it work. So now I'm booted up into Windows. And uh, look... We have a mouse cursor, so now you can see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, you know, first first time video problems. Uh, anyway, what's interesting is in Chrome and Windows, now when I go into the Unify network, I get the new dashboard. Uh, so that is exciting. I really like the new real-time usage uh, indicator. If we were to pull up a, uh, uh, pull up a speed test, uh, you can see real time what's coming through your, uh, you know, your WAN interface. <clears throat> Same thing with the upload. So that's really nice. Um, as you can see, uh, as you can see down here, they uh, want us to add some access points. So that is the next project. Uh, we've got five packs of the Unify AC Pro access point. I was going to use a smaller version of this and newer with Wi-Fi 6, but the Wi-Fi 6 AP lights uh, have a limit of 2 on the Ubiquiti site, and I needed 30, obviously, so that's unfortunate, but these are still phenomenal access points. I really like them a lot. Um, to take off the bracket here so you can get to the Ethernet port, uh, there's a small slot on the side. You take a bent paper clip, stick it in there. Maybe. And it should slide underneath that. And you can twist that plate counterclockwise. And then it lifts off. And the UAP Pro has a what little weatherproof bushing here. 
Um, you're not supposed to use it in direct weather. It's not quite sealed up that well, I don't believe. Uh, but if it's under like a, an awning or an eave uh, of a roof, something like that, you can use the rubber grommet to seal it up against critters and that kind of thing. UAP Pro also has two Ethernet jacks, a main and a secondary. You have to plug it into the main Ethernet jack for it to power up via PoE. Uh, so we'll do that now with all five of these. It should light up with a white ring, let you know it has power, and then it'll stand by to be adopted. And back at the computer, you can see the Dream Machine has detected that we have five UAP pros ready to go. So we'll go ahead and just tell it to add them. Sometimes that goes ahead and adopts. Yes, it looks like it's going to. Uh, so we'll go back to devices, take a look at what they're doing. Okay, so it's going to bring those in, provision them, uh, put the Wi-Fi networks on them. And we'll be able to test it out here in a second. You can see the switches are down because we unplugged them. And we'll go through and do the same labeling and IP address scheme with these. Should go ahead and tell them to upgrade. Moves them around on you sometimes. In the meantime, I can get my trusty P-Touch out. We're going to just label them AP1, AP2, 4, P5. And you can do this uh, the other direction as well, um, which may be easier sometimes. In this case, since there are so many, I will. I'm just going to slap the numbers on the access points and then match them up in the software instead of hunting them down the other way. So, now that we are back over here, it looks like all five of those took their upgrade just fine. See the last four, the MAC address highlighted here. Uh, that's what we're going to hunt for for when we label these. So, this is AP5. You look down here, and right underneath the barcode, I believe, is the MAC address. So we will match that up. It's a yes. Fox Fox 26. So this will be AP5. We'll go in here, config, and label this one AP5. Done. And I will do the same with the rest of them. Alright, so on the phone, I'm going to go to Wi Fi. I should see both of those networks now, which I do. So Delta South Guest and Delta South Private. I'm going to try this one. There we go. A lot of typos today for me. There we go. And that should give us the correct VLAN. Yep, 192.168.1.1. Uh, I should also show up if we go over here to the Clients tab. Close all these access points out. If we go to the Clients tab, you should see my iPhone here now. Which we do. I am connected to that access point on that network. There we go. 
believe you can drill down even further see a lot of their uh, a lot of other information about you know the clients what they're doing <clears throat> and you can see what protocols they're using what what's doing the most traffic uh, on that device and that's it so I'm gonna do the rest of the access points and uh, we'll have a full house I'm gonna change this up just a little bit the last batch of access points I did uh, I forgot to give them a static IP so I'm gonna actually after this batch plug them back in and uh, go ahead and assign those a static IP what I like to do is keep things in somewhat groups in my IP pool so all my switch gear main gear will be in the dot ones uh, I'm gonna start the access points at dot eleven uh, that just makes more sense to me. So whenever you're going through AP1 would be 192.168.1.11. Um, so then as we go, we'll name this one AP6. And this will be... Go down to network, change that to a static IP. I'm going to make that 16. It is a shame that they don't autofill this and just let you do that, but it, it's, uh, it's not the way it works. So, do <laughs> the changes there, apply the changes. That's that. We also need to save that. So now it is AP6. And we'll do the same thing on down the line. And then I'll go through with my handy P touch labels and label the access points physically. B7, go ahead and save. Down to network, static IP, got 17. Now, I like doing them when they're plugged in so I can verify that it actually took, I think, I'll verify this here in a minute, I think we can go ahead and change the static IP on these and the next time that they uh, boot up, they will be updated to their new IP address. In fact, we'll just try it here before we, uh, before we get too far. Network. My Bluetooth keyboard has decided to be a little punk today, so sorry for the loud clicking, annoying keyboard. Save that. Okay. Also, for whatever reason, Ubiquity in the alphanumeric organization here, um, yeah, 10 is before 2. So that's mildly annoying. <laughs> OCD. Drives me crazy. Nothing seems to work either. You can put an underscore in there or a hyphen and it doesn't seem to change it. So if anybody has any tips on that, please leave me a comment below. There it is. All right. Uh, sometimes you get this error too with the little exclamation point. Um, it 
It says something about the stun server. That seems to be just something that pops up when they provision sometimes and usually goes away. Never actually had it be an issue, so not sure. All right, so AP-10, Fox Fox 1-6. I usually label them right above the Unify logo um, as to not cover up any of the other information. Uh, you don't want to cover up the MAC address and that kind of thing. Uh, it's not a big deal the way that Ubiquity prints these on here, but a lot of access points have actual stickers. Um, well, ruckus access points do, for example, and if you put something else on it after a while and you have to peel it off, everything comes with it. So I don't typically like to do that. We're going to try our little theory of updating AP1 through 5 and then plugging them in to see, make sure that they do their thing. I'm going to start these at 11. Network. All right, so let's plug those in and see how they get. Okay, so it looks like AP5 did go ahead and update to its new IP address. And we'll wait here and double check all of these and then slam them back in the box. Yeah, AP3 is also changing its IP address. Go ahead and start prepping the next set here. All right, 11 through 15, we're gonna go ahead and add those. Okay, so as you can see, we've got the network set up now. We'll go back to the devices tab. <coughs> Switches are all here. If we look at the access points, got all 30 of them provisioned. Box back up, they're all in order. Uh, should be ready to go out and deploy these things. So that'll be here in a couple days. Um, give me a shout if you have any other topics you want to get covered. Uh, see if I can help out with that. Um, subscribe to the channel. Thanks a lot. We'll see you.